Okay, um, this next group is, is a very interesting mix. We're referring to this as our next gen motorsports panel because these folks, well, they saw a problem. They came up a way, with a way to solve that problem for themselves, mainly. A and then they turned that solution into a new business. Technology is our friend, but not all of us are smart enough to develop new technology. But all of our experts here today have built a platform for their creations that are so easy to use that even if you have not even mastered programming that old obsolete VHS recorder, which you have, of course, given up on, you can handle any one of these folks' uh, creations up here. So I also have a little bit of help <clears throat> because we're getting to that afternoon where my voice is going to start failing if I don't get help. So helping me out is Mr. John Warniak from SEMA. Uh, John has utilized his engineering expertise and management savvy on projects as diverse as the Stealth Bomber and Soapbox Derby cars. He currently applies that expertise to help automotive aftermarket companies understand vehicle technology challenges, develop solutions, and capitalize on new business opportunities presented by complex systems and new technologies. As I said earlier, John also hosts some of the most fascinating seminars out at the SEMA show, so look those up when you're out there in Vegas. I know you got a lot to see at SEMA, but John's seminars are must-view material when he's out there. So, Mr. John Warniak, thank you very much for your help in co-moderating this panel this year. Well, thank you, Dr. D. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, How many folks have been here before, Racetrack Business Conference? How many are new? Well, that's a good sign. I'm going to kick this off. I'm going to start off with a video. I'm going to take you back in time. 1902 to be specific. Uh, watch this video. It starts off. There's no sound in the beginning, which is uh, by design. And watch some of these photos and as it transitions to the sound. And I want you to think of yourself back in that time, 1902. most famous customers. The cinema and the motor car grew up together. By 1902, both were forms of popular entertainment in France. Few early films have survived, but these were found in remarkably good condition. It was a thrill when this enterprising cameraman took his camera aboard a motor car but it is even more exciting to find included shots of one of the great races from city to city, the Paris-Vienna of 1902. Anybody there? In the few years since German cars and engines were supreme, speeds had risen dramatically, and French cars now led the world. French cars now led the world. Linda, Linda. Number seven is a 70 horsepower Panhard driven by Henri Farman. 70 horsepower. I think that's probably in like a CPO or something like that now, right? Or maybe a Dune or cart or something like that. But, uh, 70 horsepower. But, uh, I wanted to show that because that's where next generation is. If you put yourself in that generation of motorsports back then, things were happening. And as strange as it is to us looking back at that, that's how strange it would be for today for us, looking at we're millennials, those between like uh, born in 1980, 2000 or so. And there's a few here, right? That's how strange it is in terms of where motorsports is going in next generation. And this great, great panel that Tim and Dennis have put together, we're going to talk about that, next generation motorsports, particularly next generation business. And my background is vehicle technology, vehicle engineering, systems engineering. And you think about the 919 Porsche Spider that won Le Mans this year. The kinetic energy recovery system, uh, everything that has evolved on that car in the last couple of years, hybrids, notice no diesels. Our good friends at Volkswagen took care of that. And we're going to see a lot more of that. But just as much as that car has evolved, the business has not. And I think you're going to hear how it is evolving today with actual business case studies of how the business is evolving. 
Again, put yourself back to 1902 with some of the things that we'll be talking about here. Everyone knows the story of Henry Ford, right? If he had had a focus group, what would he have asked them? Or what would they have responded? Give me a faster horse. So the whole idea is, you know, you got to go to the Gemba. And racing is the Gemba, the front line of what's happening. And you have to go to that. And that's why we have this panel here today. So motorsports is all about disruption. The technology and now the business is starting to catch up very quickly. And it's not going to be kind of continuous improvement. It's going to go through, again, kind of a step function. And it already is in some of the cases, and we'll hear more about that. Anybody here familiar with uh, Robo Race? How about Formula E? Robo Race. We, we had a group of 10 uh, motorsports leaders at the SEMA show uh, from Robo Race. Uh, started in Moscow, young folks. And Formula E has been third year, I think, Rob? Third year with uh, Formula E. And racing and performance are actually a part of the autonomous future. Racing started, as you saw in 1902, for basically technology demonstration and problem solving. And if you ask Mark Royce, General Motors today, it still is all about that. So autonomy is going to be a big part of those problem solving and using the, again, the motorsports engineers to help solve some of those problems. The car on the left there, NVIDIA, is the one of the first Robo, Robo Race prototypes. They all have a uh, standard computer. It'll be kind of like the old IROC series, Michelin spec wheels, running sp suspension, gear, et cetera, and the PX2 computer. And it's not a CPU. How many folks know what a CPU is? central processor and computer processing unit. It's moving to GPUs, graphic processing unit, so the car can see, sense, and respond. And that's really what's happening in terms of the future. So again, the Robo Race car and the Formula E car. How many folks have been to a Formula E race? A few. That's good. I think there's one in New York coming up uh, July, isn't it? Right. But if you think about that, these are called S-curves. I know Herb, Herb Fischel's familiar with these. We plot a lot of these back in GM Racing. If you look at how long it's taken technologies to get adopted, look at some of those things. Who was at the 1902 race? Here, here. You probably remember washers and dryers coming on board, right? Things like that. Radio. <laughs> but if you look how long it took to get to like 80% adoption rates, and then you look at the computer, VCR, internet. Look at that, 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 that slope of that curve, the derivative, how fast. And there's something that you have in front of you right now, each of you has one, a smartphone, that is the fastest adoption technology in the history of mankind. That's how fast some of these businesses are going to evolve and are evolving that we'll hear from on this panel. I mentioned before about the uh, uh, Formula E. If you go out to the Consumer Electronics Show this year, uh, qualifying starts on Wednesday, I think. Then on Saturday, they're pitting 20 racers against 10 e-gamers. So Formula E is engaging that generation, the millennials, and I think it's a million dollar prize, Rob. Rob can tell us a little more about that. Yeah, they just uh, actually have the finalists, uh, people that have uh, did some sim racing online uh, from around the world. They've got the last 10, they, or the, the final 10, that are going to race against our uh, 20 of our Formula E drivers. Uh, and, and it's a million dollar purse. So somebody's going to leave their first prize is $200,000. So. Um, that's how Formula is promoting to try and get uh, a younger audience uh, interested in uh, racing. And think about that, 200,000 bucks for either a gamer or a, a racer. racer. That's a pretty good chunk of change to have. And the reason I mention that is in terms of engaging, and uh, actually Ralph Shaheen talked about this a bit last year, and uh, you think about the Monster Energy Supercross series. It takes a lot, took a lot of risk, particularly with the media side of the business, not so much the technology. But if you look at what Again, what they've done in terms of connecting the brands, the fans, and the experiences. And now, again, no, no disrespect to my good friend Jimmy Johnson, Monster did not make Supercross. Supercross made Monster. So if you think about Monster coming into Supercross, it's only one element. Can it help connect the fans? Possibly. I hope it does. But can it bring a whole generation, a culture? One of the best measurements of a brand, whether it be NASCAR or Monster Energy or Racetrack Business Conference, is its culture. The best measurement of that brand is its culture. And again, you are all too part of that racetrack business conference culture. So think about that. And then there's something that happened back with uh, what I call the Sebring Supercross factor. The last three hours of the Sebring race were preempted by Supercross. Think about that. Arguably one of the best road races in this country, maybe the world. And Fox Sports won 
put Supercross on instead, instead of the last three hours of Sebring. What does that tell you about the TV audience watching motorsports? What was important to that TV audience in Fox 1? That's the point we want to make with some of the business things that are happening with the next generation. This is what I'll call the systems approach to motorsports. And basically, if you think of all those six dimensions of sport, we did this when I was at No Fear, if you concentrate on any one of those elements, and again, I think any one of those elements or dimensions touches upon someone here. And I think we have all six represented, whether it's the event, the equipment, the athletes, the fans, the organization, or the sponsors. And it takes all of those. That's why my point was about a sponsor like Monster coming into NASCAR. It's only one-sixth of the overall system. You have to put it all together. And they all have to play well together to make it a successful whatever it may be, series, culture, brand, whatever it may be. And again, from uh, Zach Brown, leveraging the power of the sport. I think that's what we're looking at. So I want to turn it over back over to Dennis and to our panelists, because I think these are the guys and their companies, the men and women of your companies, that are taking us into the future. Thank you very much, John. And a uh, little different feel to these panels here, uh, for this panel, for the Next Gen group. We're going to introduce you to these three very useful programs or apps or you know systems of doing different things and encourage you to give them a try and then I'm gonna pass things back to John to talk about the business side of of what these three are doing and have in common so our first guest on the far side uh, is the head of growth for something called rally bus this is just the coolest idea that I've ever heard of when you're going to a major sporting event or a major event, what is the worst part of that experience? It's getting to the event and it's getting home from the event. Well, our guest is a technologist by trade, but sort of stumbled into this almost by accident because there was a political rally going on in Washington, D.C. and the light bulb went off and he decided that rally bus use existing transportation in a market to get people to a big event and carried a good percentage, a, a pretty healthy chunk of the fans to the Battle of Bristol this year. Uh, 160 some thousand people and about what, two, three percent of those people came on rally bus, so pretty cool idea. So the question I have for you is, now that you have experience doing this for big events, can rally bus be used by local track promoters to sort of be a, a thank you night for participating marketing partners around the area, different businesses, a, a get out to the track day? Certainly, um, and thank you for that great introduction. Uh, to put it simply, rally has moved hundreds of thousands of people by creating the ultimate ride share. Book a seat from a rally point or a bus stop near you, spread the word, and we confirm or kickstart bus trips on demand. And we've done so, and, and a, as uh, we said here, that this was a, a passion to begin with. I actually created this and picked up every phone call to begin with, and some of the first people that called were NASCAR fans. And we moved these people because what we find ourselves is, is this place called mobility, right? There's this concept that, that we've seen what technology can do to transportation and mobility. But so far, we've seen it in rental cars or taxis or personal mobility. But what Rally's concentrating on is what we like to call community mobility. And whether it's this community here or the other communities we've been talking about, that's, what, that's why fans are going to the tracks, to be a part of a community. And Rally is extending that experience through the travel time. And to answer your question more directly, yeah, we've applied this to big races, but to events of all kinds, and if we embrace that community more and think about them through that difficult part of the journey, uh, I think rally can be applied to events of all kinds. Our next guest in the middle, um, one thing I've learned is don't tell Brian he can't do something. And whether that's something like curling your tongue when you were a kid uh, or developing a registration application for motorsports that is quite simply the coolest thing I've seen. He goes ahead and, you know, he, he turns a, a process that used to be a pain in the butt into a good experience 
by getting people pre-registered for events. And as we mentioned earlier uh, in the day, it, it's helping out quite, quite a bit. It, it literally has been building a better mousetrap for this sport. Uh, how does this service really help promoters to maximize an event? Well, Dennis and Tim, thank you for having us. Uh, we were here at the very first one of these, and we've been to all of them. We love coming, so thanks. Uh, Motorsport Reg is mostly used by uh, volunteers, nights and weekends kind of people, or people who are full-time staff, like at some of the racetracks here in the room, uh, but people who don't have enough time in their day, which is everyone. So, I mean, really, our, our core value proposition is automating tasks, uh, improving accuracy, and then growing participation. And so, for organizers who uh, could always use a few more bodies in the room or at the track, whatever the, the case is, uh, we help with those three main things. So uh, it started off as scratching my own itch now about uh, 12 years ago or so. And you know we shared some data from um, the, the panel earlier. You know This year, we'll register somewhere around 275,000 people. This is mostly for uh, road course related events or autocross or car control clinics, things like that, but about 275,000 people for 5,000 events. Incredible growth that you've seen in the recent years. And uh, you also did such a great job recently um, hosting a webinar um, on safety that was just fantastic. So great job on that as Thanks. well. Thanks. Uh, if we're not safe, uh, there's no one to participate. So we care about that too. Our final guest, Josh Holt, is the co-founder of My Race Pass. And you know, Josh, you're one of those crazy guys that has more guts than me of racing one of those wing sprint cars. Uh, it looks so much fun, but I wouldn't have the guts to do it. And, and Josh was a guy who, he, he saw a need for a better and more affordable way for drivers like himself to promote themselves. And quite frankly, there's a lot of sharks out there in the web design business. He came up with driver websites. Great service, great prices, and understanding what racers needed and being able to network them all together is what made him such a success. And now, a little over a year ago, teaming up with your co-founders over at My Race Pass, I think you got something here, young man. So tell folks a little bit about My Race Pass. So, <clears throat> as Dennis said, we, we started a company called Driver Websites. We're primarily focused on building websites for the race car driver, um, trying to give them ways to be able to sell apparel, promote their sponsors, promote themselves, and, uh, you know, and very cost effectively and be able to use uh, social media interacting with the website. Um, we had a big plan, a big goal, and that was my race pass, but we knew we needed to get a client base before we could really do a lot with my race pass. Um, starting in 2008 is when we started doing websites. Um, we, we did just over 600 websites in the last how many years that is um, for drivers, racetracks, and businesses. Um, but what my race pass is, to get to your question, um, Every one of those websites that we built were kind of connected, um, meaning it's a, my race pass. I always explain it's a globalized network of websites. So a good example of that is, is we do like the ASC, it's the American Sprint Car Series. We do their website, which the same people that put on the Chili Bowl. I'm mean, more familiar with some of you. Um, we do that website as well. But we do like the top 16 out of the top 20 uh, drivers sites within ASCS, and all of their results, their news, their photos, their videos. <coughs> all get updated automatically from the ASCS events that they hit. So it's, you know, how you tag your buddy on Facebook and it shows up on their profile. Uh, a lot of that works the same way with my race pass to where when they tag a news article, it shows up on a driver's profile. The cool thing is, is since we've done all these different racetrack websites since then and all these different driver sites since then, um, a single driver could have a driver profile on over 100 to 150 different websites that we've done. So when he updates that information, um, that information gets spread throughout the entire network. And what's really cool is if you misspell a news article, you can you know, change it and it updates throughout everywhere. Um, a good example of, to look at it is, is SprintSource.com, the website that we did. That's a uh, an aggregate, basically, of all the sprint car sites that we do. There's thousands of lines of, I mean, millions of lines of data. There's uh, thousands of events, results, news, photos, videos. And that site is, um, like I said, an aggregate of all the different sprint car sites that we do. Um, that is not any content on that website we do not put on there ourselves. Um, it's all comes from the network. And what's handy about that is with racetracks, um, that's that many more avenues that drivers can help promote that show. 
we do we do much more than just websites. We we do uh, we we have we always try to find ways to incentivize the drivers to help promote the event. Um, we actually have a thing with uh, with tickets where drivers can help sell tickets and actually make money doing so, and that money that the drivers make does not come out of the promoter's pocket. Um, so we got a lot of exciting things with my race pass. Uh, we, we have a very wide product line. We do we do apparel as well. Um, we're just trying to find ways to make it easier using technology um, for racetracks to do what they do. I've been a promoter as well. I had Rock Rapids in 2012 and was the general manager at Park Jeff in 2014 dirt tracks. Um, so I've been on all sides of the fence, and and learning from that over the years. You know, we're just trying to make things easier and try to make it easier for you guys to put fans in the stands and make it easier for the, the drivers to help do that. And Josh is the man in dirt track racing in that part of the country from the Silicon Prairie of Lincoln, Nebraska, all over the Dakotas, all the way down through Oklahoma, Texas, uh, up into all of the sprint car land there. Um, he's the man, but there is no reason that road course guys can't use that same philosophy of turning all of their drivers into not only, I mean, not only to bring fans in, but to bring more drivers to the track as well. Uh, it works, and it is just a genius uh, product that you put together there, and uh, actually makes drivers money, which makes them very happy, because then they get to more shows. That's exactly right. Put Thank on you. a show. Uh, you mentioned that disruption, innovation, if you will, is uh, basically finding a solution or a product for an underserved market. Now, each one of you have found that underserved market. Now, let's start with you, Newman. I mean, how do you come across that? I think from an audience perspective, looking at the segments that they want to increase, either fans, uh, whatever they may be doing in terms of motorsports business, how did you find that underserved market and then develop a solution around that? Right, well, I always say sending a bus to a race isn't new. Right? A lot of what we're talking about is already being done, in, in, but we're doing it in tr more traditional ways. And we're applying technology to an old concept, making it easier for people to get together and making it more fun. You know, I've been sitting here in the audience and hearing about how to market to fans when they're at home, how to make the experience better when they're at the track, or what about the operations around the track? Well, what about between those two times? That's what Rally's concentrating on. And we're making it more experiential, more fun on the way in. We're giving you a marketing platform to reach those customers for hours more on race day. But we're making it safer and easier too, that we can actually impact your operational plan. So when we talk about um, an old concept like buses, what is it gonna look like in the future? And how is it gonna be embraced by the tracks themselves? That's what we're here to, to address. I kind of like what I'll, what I'll call the Uber of the motorsports industry, getting people to the race and back. I'll take that any day. Safe. Thanks. Take it. That can be your tagline. You can steal that <laughs> one. So. Brian, from your point, I mean, how do you find this underserved market? I, I think innovation, I mean, there's two kinds of innovation. There's incremental innovation, and then there's radical innovation. So Elon Musk's Hyperloop is not an incremental innovation. Uh, it's, I mean, he's a little crazy, and so he's got this amazing idea. You know. 12 years ago when we started Motorsport Reg, uh, I mean, we were just taking, and I'll say just because I don't think it's that radical, taking these paper-based processes uh, in an organization where I was volunteering at the time and converting them to be digital. You know, my background was in web development and the organization was taking paper forms, paper checks, uh, creating spreadsheets by hand, et cetera, et cetera. So you're just wasting copious amounts of time that can be better used somewhere else. And so a lot of what we've done over the last 10 years or 12 years is looked at how to reallocate the limited number of, of hours, in most cases, versus money, um, towards something of higher value. So when we think about, you know, you could manually process registrations, which uh, with a volunteer could be free, in air quotes. Um, but alternatively, that volunteer could be doing something much better, like maybe promoting the event or talking to your customers or retaining customers. So in many ways, you know, I would say that uh, MSR over time has been more of incremental innovation by looking for a problem in, in this case, one that I personally faced, uh, and then finding a way to, to make that better for, you know, a industry where there's enough economies of scale to make a business out of. Um, there's folks that try to boil the ocean, and then there's, you know, more targeted approaches like what we do, and I think those uh, appeal to different kinds of people, but I think both are valuable kinds of innovation. 
know, over the last couple of years, we've been building a, a live timing app because we had some uh, things that we wanted to accomplish that were a little bit different around publishing results, race results for organizations in a more automated fashion. And, you know, again, scratching that own itch is going to be the way for most entrepreneurs, at least, to be interested in something over the long term. And so I think uh, there's many problems that we can solve. Not all people should try to solve all problems. So it's where those two things overlap mm -hmm. that I think is the best kind of innovation for the people in this room. So however you need to find uh, incremental or radical, you know, in our sport, unless you're robo race, mm -hmm. you know, most of us, if we're a facilities owner or something along those lines, uh, radical innovation of, you know, tearing down the facility and building something different is probably unlikely. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't be testing all the time to be finding those those meaningfully incremental uh, steps forward. And you are. Being from Silicon Valley, again, you, the, the, f the culture, if you will, of it's okay to fail to take that risk. I mean, F1 has been criticized for not taking some of those media-type risks. Uh, I, I think if the risk you're taking is betting the farm on, on an idea, then you're betting big and you win or you go home, right? But I think maybe the more accurately described, the Silicon Valley mentality is to test frequently and test often. And so therefore, you're not really about, it's not about failing, but it's about experimenting. Mm -hmm. And so if you reframe um, the changes you might make as an experiment or a test within some boundaries that uh, maybe don't risk your entire operation, then I think that's, that's to be expected and to be celebrated. And that's where you do find those wins. Okay, so don't just bet the farm, bet the pig. <laughs> so Josh, how, how'd you find some of your underserved markets? And you've had a couple of them you've discovered? Yeah. Well, with, with the stuff that we do, I'm trying to figure out the best way to answer that. You know, we have done a, a really wide wide range of, pro we have a wide product line, and we've, we've tried to f find different things that we can do to try to help our racetracks, as I was mentioning earlier. We're trying to find uh, ways, just like you said, to save that time, you know. Um, the hardest thing that we've we've come across is uh, this that, uh, that 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 change that idea of change. There's there's uh, pen and paper ways of doing things, and there's and there's using technology to be able to advance. You know what you can do, but like you said, you know mentioned uh, those people instead of doing online or instead of doing pen and paper for registration, let's do it online to let them people let those people that are normally doing it on paper do something different to help promote the show. Um, the the hardest thing that we've come across is is the change and and the you know we we like to find the forward thinking promoters the the forward thinking mentality and we try to find ways to get our product into the the hands of the millennials which I know we're going to talk about here in a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but that's that's what I got on that. Any questions for you, Dr. D, to the panel? Uh, I just want to uh, see if you guys have experimented much with. Um, you know, when I send out different things, trying to see what I can do to, to get fans excited about a show that's coming up, I'll try something different on Facebook, then I'll try on Twitter, then I'll try on Instagram, whatever. It, have you guys worked with any sort of A and B testing of, of what sort of moves the, the needle a little bit, and does that vary depending on whether you're trying to reach an older race fan or a newer person? Certainly. We always have to be experimenting, and that's, that's the business we're all in here. We're trying to push the envelope, trying to, trying to uh, innovate. Uh, when we talk about what we're trying to solve, though, transportation for us is something that cuts across everyone. Uh, and we've, had, we've moved fans, uh, tweens, all the way up to seniors, and, and to the same events, too. The fact of the matter is, you can look at millennials and, and the fact that they're owning less cars and, and see the trends there and why they might use us. But there's been fans that have been going to your races for years that are just tired of driving and dealing with the issues. And so we see it cutting across the board and we're always experimenting with how we can make a better user experience, whether it's in the app and letting people track the buses, letting people communicate that community um, on the bus itself or uh, actually on the bus. And what we can do there to engage the audience, this captive audience of fans that we have with an AV system on board, with drinks in hand, with a bathroom on board, what can we do with all that? I can talk about a couple of tactics we use, some real specific stuff. Um, so in Motorsport Reg, when people start the registration process, we know who they are at that point. And one of the things we do is if they don't complete the registration, 
we send them an email a couple of days later, uh, which is a pretty common thing that e-tailers will do. It's an, ab an abandoned shopping cart email. And so in that email, we'll basically reach out and say, we saw that you started, but you didn't finish. Did you need some help? Did you get stuck? Can't find a credit card, whatever the issue might be. And one of the A-B tests that we've run is we've run a variety of copy in those outreach emails, and one of the three uh, versions we ran performed like 10% higher. So when you're thinking about the number of people who fall out of a shopping cart, which the, the industry-wide standard is something like 66% of your people uh, that go to an e-commerce site will add something to a shopping cart but not complete the process. So two-thirds of potential customers walk away. The ability to convert 10% more of that 66% uh, is a pretty valuable thing. I mean, that's a direct revenue, uh, falls to the bottom line kind of deal. So like that's one example where all we did was run three different versions of the copy, uh, subject line and body copy in that email, and we found one that runs 10% better. So I, I mean, effectively free, you know, it takes only a few extra minutes to write an extra headline or something like that, uh, and you get those extra benefits. Another big trend that we've seen uh, recently that some email campaign software support is, uh, there's been A-B testing software in email campaign software for a while now, so you can try two different subject lines, for example, and see which one opens better. Uh, but there's now kind of a new, uh, a newer technique, which is you send out your email blast the first time, it goes to let's say 10,000 people. And let's say only 5,000 people open it. Well, now you can send a second email to the 5,000 people that didn't open it with a different subject line. So what you're doing is following up on the people that didn't take action the first time around to get a further penetration into your existing sort of customer base and so forth. And so, you know, again, thinking about innovation and testing, um, we all wanna grow sales. But one way to grow sales is like just to improve your conversion rate. And so like on Motorsport Reg, one thing we look at really hard is how many people get through the registration process, uh, what we can do to streamline and improve that, and then if they should fall out, because they fall out for a variety of reasons, you know, the boss walks in when they're at work and <laughs> notices they're <laughs> doing what they're not supposed to be doing, uh, we can remind them later at a better time and they can come back and complete the process. So um, lots of, I mean, honestly, lots of very simple techniques in many cases that can, that can drive single or double digit uh, improvements to revenue or conversion, and I mean, that's good for everyone's business. Yeah, I, th I think a question, of, you mentioned the transportation, Iman, and I think the, the innovation in transportation, whether it be cars, trucks, automobiles, whatever it may be, when you look at the startup mentality, and a lot of the newer startups on the manufacturing side or product side are cruise automation, Commodot AI, auto, Uber certainly happens. Are there any uh, ways that there are incubators set up for you guys? I mean, like, come on, with tech stars. Are there many tech stars out there to help this group incubate or accelerate some of their business ideas? It's a great point. Uh, we went through the tech stars mobility program, uh, this concept of business accelerator. I wouldn't be here today where I am without this concept of, of support from mentors like yourself that are helping these incubators. So whether it's in with an existing business, um, that startup mentality, this entrepreneurship, it can be within any company, and it doesn't have to be betting the farm. Um, it's, it's trying to innovate and experiment and enabling your team to be able to do that, and I think there's going to be incubators, if not yet, I think we're talking about something right here yeah. uh, that, could w uh, that could benefit the industry. Absolutely. I think Thunder Hill Raceway has a uh, bring your autonomous car. I think it's every month. started a couple months ago. NVIDIA's out there. Comma.ai was out there. Actually, George Holtz, one of the founders of Comma.ai, was the first to take the lap of the track with an autonomous car. NHTSA summoned him in and pretty much told him cease and desist because he couldn't prove how the system worked. <laughs> but the point is they're pushing that and it's the two types of innovation you mentioned, Brian. Any other comments on incubators? Uh, I can just say I'm on the board for Thunder Hill uh, as my Excellent. volunteer <laughs> so you know. volunteer work. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we had an autonomous uh, car day there just about four months ago, I think it was. Okay. Ouch. Where's Mr. Bowles? Where's he at? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm not aware of incubators that are, that are focused on more of a facilities perspective or so forth, but certainly, I mean, I think that's a great example of, of where you can bring things together. And we have um, been centrally located near the Silicon Valley uh, where there is Sonoma Raceway and Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca. Uh, those are two difficult tracks to book, and they are both expensive. So one thing that Thunder Hill does uh, get a lot of business from are people who want to test vehicle technologies. Uh, you know, where your facility is located would dictate whether or not that works for somebody else. But I think, uh, you know, alternative uses of your venues, different kinds of demographics, you know, certainly there's lots of folks that have tough mutters um, or other sort of sporting events at their facilities. 
I think it's the mentality more so than the incubator. That's a good point. It's like that the video we showed, 1902, that's where Thunder Hill was with that first autonomous car racing. Josh, any comments yeah. there? I mean, uh, being a what I want to know with Josh is how the heck did you get people in the dirt track racing world to all pull on the same end of the rope to make my race pass so successful? They're in other forms of racing, namely asphalt, circle track, uh, it's almost like everybody's trying to fight against each other rather than work together. You guys are a great example of bringing a lot of very smart people together to work on that project. Well, we try really hard. You know, it was a, it was a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat when we first started as a company, you know, and, and doing a lot of websites. And being in my background in sprint car racing, I knew a lot of the people in the sprint car world. Um, it certainly doesn't stop there. I mean, we, when we had those, we, we, we started providing solutions to the problems that people had. You know, and 2012 was a really big year for the company because I had Rock Rapids. And we had, uh, I had my two partners who were the tech guys there, and I was able to show them each and every week what the problems were at running the racetrack, and that's what evolved our race management system. Um, with that, we were, we were racers, we were tech guys, and we were able to provide problems to these solutions, or solutions to the problems that these guys were having, and we could show that, that benefit. And we, we grew pretty fast in the sprint car world, and now we're starting, you know, we have a, we have a modified organization that's actually gonna be mandating the use of our product this year um, to all their racetracks. Um, and I think it's just that following that, that, you know, that brand, so to speak, um, to show them that, you know, we're here to help. Uh, we're here to help just make life easier for them. And I, I, it, just, it just worked for us. But it was a lot of work. Thank you. And this, this is the white flag question, so it's the last one. Uh, I don't know what time we dropped the flag, but I think we're done, right? So, but uh, question to all of you, from your perspectives, what should this audience be the biggest takeaway? In terms of insights, trends, from your advice, Whatever you think, what should this audience know about the next generation of motorsports businesses that they can actually use or should be looking for on their radar? Uh, from my perspective, I think uh, to touch on the last question, each of the, your tracks are an incubator. That if we're trying to address these challenges of how do we market better, how do we deliver a better user experience, how do we deal with the logistics, each of these places we have to be experimenting or else, yeah, then there's just challenges of business if we do not innovate and you know, we live in a growth world everyone here is trying to produce more revenue well how can we find new avenues of revenue how can we be involved in more aspects of the customer journey um, and for us of course that's the mobility aspect and of course we'd love for you to speak to you further about that so use your track as an incubator great thank you Newman. Brian uh, I think one of the more important things on our horizon uh, for everyone in the room would be autonomous vehicles. Uh, and this is a little bit further out, so it's not a, a five-year issue, but I don't think it's as far away as people think. Um, I think that there's huge opportunities and obviously threats as the, as the country moves towards a more autonomous vehicle sort of world. Uh, when people look at vehicles as utilities, like an Uber, versus something that you own, uh, I think there's both pros and cons, actually, as it relates to uh, at least participatory motorsports, which is what we more focus on rather than spectator motorsports. Um, I think if you've got a facility, you should be concerned or at least thinking about what it means when people don't own necessarily as many cars. Um, however, I think the potential upside is that as you free up money that's currently spent on maybe a minivan for the family today, and you replace that with... Um, uh, utility vehicles where for 10 cents a mile or whatever the case is, you can send your kids to school, you can get your groceries and so forth. There's the potential uh, that a huge amount of discretionary income becomes available to people in this country when uh, car repair bills go down. Uh, I mean, there's entire industries that would be revolutionized by the autonomous vehicle switchover. And this is kind of, I think, a seven to 10 year change from really being a serious deal here. So I would be thinking on that kind of timeline what the opportunities are, um, and position yourself to be there. You know, it's not, a, it's not a tomorrow thing. There's not a lot of things we can change for tomorrow, to be honest. But when we think about where all of our businesses will be, you know, in the not too distant future, really, I think that's a, a big one that everyone should be thinking about. There's some kid out there, I'm sure, I don't know where he's at today, and uh, maybe he'll be here in a couple years, that uh, it won't be horsepower bragging rights. It'll be saying, my car is more autonomous than yours, or my car is smarter than yours. My Josh. race car is smarter than yours. Josh. <coughs> I agree with that. The, uh, the thing I look at is the more instantaneous, I mean, more t what, what can you do tomorrow. Um, and, and, and the experience we've had with working with the racetracks that we've worked with, um, we worked with almost, we almost have 500 racetracks that we do business with, and they're dirt track, 
circle track stuff, Saturday night programs. <laughs> Internet's a big thing, so I'm just gonna use this example. I always tell the promoters, you know, we gotta put your product in the hands, or put your product in the ways that, that the millennial generation is, is, is uh, used to purchasing that product. They buy stuff online, they buy apparel online, they buy tickets online. Um, a lot of people, some of the webinars I've done uh, through my race pass, and you know, we talk about internet, we talk about Wi-Fi. Now, my race pass, we have a race management program um, for the speed line, the back gate, and the throughout the night, and all that stuff. It's an online-based program, so like you need to have internet at your facility to to use my race pass. Um, we had a ton of pushback on that. You know, there's so many promoters who are like, "Well, I don't have internet, I can't use it. I'm done. I don't want to have internet." Well, the fact that you need internet to use my race pass isn't the reason why you need to have internet at your racetrack. Um, nothing's more frustrating for me if I'm walking around, anybody know what the Knoxville Nationals are? Um, so a couple years, they just put a new cell phone tower in there, so it's a lot better, but Chili Bowl's the same way where <laughs> the cell phone towers get plugged and you can't, you take a, you got Tony Stewart walking by and you wanna take a selfie and throw it on Facebook to let the world know how much of an awesome time you're having there, having there but you can't. And that's nothing more frustrating. Me as a business owner, I see my logo on a car and I want to take a picture of it and send it to social media because I'm proud of that. And I can't. You know, that, that's frustrating. If you remember five, six years ago, there's a lot of businesses downtown that would, ha that would advertise free Wi-Fi. Why do you think they did that? You see less and less of that, of those stickers. Why? Because they have it. It's implied. It's, it's just expected. Um, so the, the internet is, you know, let's find ways to get our product in the hands of the millennial generation, the way they're used to buying it. Um, and that's what we try to hope for, and that's what we try to, try to strive for. So that's, that's, that'd be my suggestion is, you know, really push on that. Very brilliant folks there up on the stage, and uh, also another brilliant man helping me co-moderate this panel. Where do we learn from our next-gen panel? Technology is our friend. Um, use it to your advantage. Um, don't try to resist not using these tools just because they're new. And if you have a great idea, if there's a thing that you do at your track or your facility or whatever that makes life easier for you, get with one of these guys. They'll find you a developer or they'll develop it with you and turn it into another business for you in addition to running the track. Um, Josh was w wasting a lot of money racing and now is doing quite well with my race pass. He's a great example of taking a problem, you know, that's out there, finding a solution and then uh, making it a new business. And put the tools together. I can imagine using Motorsport Reg to, to sign people up for an event, but also finding a way to uh, sign them up, sign fans up, to use Rally Bus to come to a big event like the Knoxville Nationals or even for a local short track with your big event. And then My Race Pass tying it all together as a way to, to let the drivers be your best salesmen. So put the tools together and make them all work together. I'm sure the three of us could probably have about a six hour meeting after this. Talk about <laughs> a lot of fun stuff. Our next gen panel. Thank you, Thanks. gentlemen. Thanks, guys.